Welcome back to the Netherlands, Mark. Yes. Yeah. I've seen you put on your special shirt for today. We love the Queen, right? <laughs> yeah. All right, for the Queen. Can you tell us a little bit more about your special relationship with the Netherlands? Well, uh, since uh, 1975, I have been coming here to uh, enjoy the freedoms that only the Dutch can give. And um, uh, very much uh, love Holland. And if we elect McCain, I will be moving to Holland. Right. <laughs> Yeah, because you even celebrated your birthday uh, in the Netherlands last year, didn't you? Yeah, um, yes, I have. I try to party as much as I can. Yeah, great. Yeah. Well, for the people who don't know Mark, um, he's often introduced as the, the guy who founded the company that later became uh, Macromedia. But more important, I think he's an expert on online identity management and data portability, what in most cases is a disability. Right, and yeah. I've been listening to users ask for basic rights to control their own profile data, their social graph, their content. Everywhere I go around the world, people are asking, when will we be able to do this? And in the past year, I think we've seen a real revolution, starting with the Facebook platform, that open is the new black. But all of a sudden, everybody's open. Everybody wants to be open. Right, yeah. And on top of that, you even wrote your own book. About yes. the mess. And I have two copies of it. Great. One so I thought you. I would pass it around so everyone could take a look at it. Because, you know, we pray to the artifact, the dead tree. And though we are media people, we still remember books. You know? When television came along, we didn't forget about radio. And then when the internet came along, we're just adding more and more things. So we go back to the artifact. This guy over here, go over to him. Okay. So, so we have the book, so if you want to look at the book, but this is what the presentation is about, economics. Great, and it's available by printing on demand, you told me. Yes, so you go to Blurb, which is a, a book publisher system, and then as I, people give me new ideas, there will be a wiki about the book, and so then as we add more information on the wiki, we will update the book. And so based upon when you come to buy the book, you'll get later versions of the book. So this could be a collector's item. These are total collector's items. Buy them while they're hot. Totally. Right. right. Totally. Okay, well, I'll leave you alone with the audience. We've got 40 minutes to amaze us. So All right, here we go. Another hand, Mr. Mark Henter. Hit it. So bring the lights down because we want to get a dramatic effect. See, I wanted to uh, create something more like a, what we call in America, coffee table book. Because we are the ADD generation. We can't read, we can't stay attention too long. We can't read too many words. So there are many pictures. And the pictures tell the story. So we start off with my daughter in front of a fence that we have painted a mural. Because the web, the open mesh web, the social web, call it web whatever, is a very complicated thing. And what we're trying to do here is both we want to have a, a road map and a treatise for people who develop software so they will know how to play along well with each other. But we also need something to describe for marketeers, for people who must explain what is going on. This hopefully will help us explain. And so for me to figure out what's going on, I took this multi-dimensional equation and I painted a mural on my fence. And then I sit in my pool in California and I look at my fence and I invite people to come over and have a barbecue and to get ideas. And we paint it on the fence. So the fence is the visual metaphor for the open mesh. So I'm back in Holland and um, I've written this book and we're gonna talk about the future. And here's the fence. And there are a number of principles that we will talk about in this book. The principles of the open mesh and what does it mean to develop for the future. Okay? And then we will have different chapters which are the structure of the open mesh. And then we talk about constructs. And I start off very specific and then I get more and more nebulous. Because I don't want this to end up like a, an argument. Geeks love to argue over details. 
the minutia details. But that's, that's not the real argument. We're talking about economics. How can we stay alive by using technology? We don't want to give all the money to Google and Microsoft and Yahoo. We want some for us, right? So the first thing is that uh, I have made a lifestyle choice. I don't work for a big company. I don't go to work. I work at home. And I choose to spend a lot of time with my family and my children. And so I see everything through their eyes. So my daughter was at a party, and she saw the DJ. And she watched the DJ. And she said, can I have a turn? And she walked up and put on the headphones and started scratching. Okay? And what I realized is that this is really about the future. This is about seeing where we're going and being able to lay the right groundwork, the roadmap. This is another great shot. This guy, Dave Marin, is the architect for the Facebook platform. Really, you could argue that it was one year ago when Facebook opened up this new kind of platform that all of a sudden, open was hip. Now, Facebook only went maybe 98% of the way to open. They didn't quite go all the way open. But that forced MySpace to be open. That then triggered Microsoft to be open. That triggered Google to create open social. Right? So all these things affect each other. So, as I said, there are two kinds of users, two kinds of people that this is for. Everyone else, welcome to the ride, right? the journey. But there are people who build software, and they have to make sure to build software the right way. And there are people who have to market software, and they have to try to understand and explain what's going on, how to digitize your brand. Marco Altazzari just talked about that in the earlier session. So, Again, we have this chaotic world where there will not be one winner. It's not like Google's going to win. In the 1980s, we had Microsoft versus Apple. And in the 1990s, we had Netscape versus Microsoft, right? So we always had these battles. Now there are about five or six behemoths, okay? But again, it's not like there's going to be one winner. So we have to watch for these new trends. Every time something new comes along, how you're making money, all software is about people. We know that. So in the future, all software will have some sort of social component in it. So as I said, open is the new black. And if you type that into Google, I will come up. So that's how we create memes. That's our SEO, right? Come up with a good idea, and Google will remember it. Right? That's the ultimate SEO. Quality. Right? <laughs> so uh, Yahoo's making a comeback. Last week, they announced the new open Yahoo. Uh, Facebook now has Facebook Connect. Google has Google Friend Connect. These are all signs of opening up, of allowing users to move their data around. People would ask me, how come every time I go into another system, I have to enter all the same information over and over again? Well, you don't. You don't have to do that. By all these platforms locking you in, this is Web 1.0 strategy. Now, we're talking about Web 3.0, Web 4.0, Web 5.0, and open is the new black. All right, so as I said, these are images for... Future. Hey, Mr. Booth guy, can you turn the lights down? More down, because we want to get better photographic effect here. On stage lights, if you could. So here's the idea. So there, this is St. Paul's Cathedral in London. And we can kind of see it through the trees, right? But what we know is that the, the limbs, the trees, are right here in our face. And that is the present. And we all have to make compromises to do business with proprietary platforms to, 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 do, to suck up to some corporate guy at Philips or Elsevier or Shell, you know? There's this corporate mentality is so stodgy and set in its way. So we have to have a vision of where we're going to the future. That is St. Paul's, you see? We can just about make it out through the trees. So that's our visionary scope of where we're going. But we're also pragmatic and we're dealing with things in the short term. Does that make sense? 
Okay, so all of life is a compromise. We have to do all these things we have to do because we're trying to make some money here. We're trying to make a living. And hold on. Skipped over. All right, this is a compromise. Boom. Okay. So, again, I don't need a light on me. So if you could turn this light down, we'd get those photographs much better. Um, Ah, chak vadam. <laughs> okay. All right. Leave the light up. I will right, well, just imagine this beautiful shot in a, in a bazaar in India. Okay? And they're selling these game cartridges. And they're costing like 10 cents or something. It's, it's incredible what goes on in the real world. Right? It's incredible the kind of distributed world we're going to live in. If you're some IT guy in Dubai or Singapore, or Moscow, you want to have your own YouTube, or Flickr, or Hives, or whatever. For every culture, for every region, there will be one of everything. All right? And if I like reggae, and I like chocolate, I will want to join networks that are about reggae and chocolate. Yes, I am still a member of Facebook. Yes, I'm still a member of Hives, but that doesn't mean I don't like reggae or chocolate. And this is the world we're heading into. This is the, this crazy distributed world out there. Oh, this is the one I wish we had, complete dark. So this is this beautiful image. Okay? And, you know, I took this photo, I found it, and I could not remember what it was, you know? But it didn't matter, because it said everything I wanted to say. What it said was, everything is a URL in the cloud. Every photograph, every person, every place, everything, every time is going to be in the cloud. Do we all know what that means by the cloud? In the hard drives. There, online, all the time, forever, from now on. Okay? Now, to me, that's... Whoa, that's heavy duty, okay? Because what that means is I can now build new kinds of experiences and rely upon that Godfather at this point where he says, I'm going to make you an offer you can't refuse. You know, that's right at this time code at that point in the movie. Or when James Joyce said this, or this beautiful Picasso painting, or, or the history of something, or, or the dikes being built and the boy putting his finger in the hole in the dike, or whatever it is, it will be a URL. And when we can have everything as a URL, then we can build software that depends upon that. Okay, it's kind of weird, but it's kind of fun. Now, the next thing that we're going to have is what we call two-way APIs. The ability to pull data out as well as put it back in. Right now, all the APIs allow you to take something out. And let me give you an example. So imagine on Amazon, where you have been writing reviews of books and writing reviews of movies. But right now, that data is locked in. You can't get it out. So I was talking with Jeff Barr, the head of web services for Amazon. I said, Jeff, when are you going to give me two-way APIs? He said, well, what would you do with it? And I said, okay. I create a community of people who love the Godfather or Citizen Kane or something, right? And I could pull my reviews out. And I could bring those reviews from Yahoo Movies and for Ain't It Cool News and Rotten Tomatoes and all these different movie review sites. And I can bring and aggregate all these reviews. And then I can add media and conversation and community and then put it back into Amazon. You see? Amazon that gets better valuable content. Right? So when you have two APIs, people can go in as easy as they can go out. And with this level playing field, we can then play at the same level as Microsoft and Google, rather than them to have them stamped down on us. Okay? Okay, another key concern that has to be baked into everything is the ability for each one of us to totally control the privacy and security of our data. We have to, on an individual basis, decide who gets to see what. 
At no time should there be any fear or paranoia that because you put something online or in the cloud that all of a sudden some Russian guy gets to hack into it. That's just not true. So having access controls and privacy over everything. And here I'd like to put up the most impersonal city in the world. The place where they least respect privacy. Right? And with that, we will make sure that we get our controls. Now, there are a bunch of open standards that already exist. I know most of you are not geeks, so don't worry about the technology too much. But this is what a standard is about. When you can have a notion of a watch or a record player or a DVD player or something, and then you can make it so cheap that you can hand them out for 10 cents a piece, 5 cents a piece in the marketplace. That's the benefits of standards. Now, we're going to develop our own infrastructure, right? They're going to look like pipes. They're going to look like wires. There's going to be a cloud. And what we won't do is we won't rely upon one vendor. This is the problem with Twitter. Twitter's one vendor doing tremendous stuff. But what we need are 100 copies of Twitter so that if one of them go down, the other ones stay up. That's what's called infrastructure. Right? We need the notion of an underlying ID layer so that if I have an account and I like baseball and reggae and chocolate and I go to a different place, well, you know who I am and what I like. These are fundamental things that we're all going to share. This is not something that Google gets to control. Right? All right. Now, when you see all these different things going on, what you do is you look for something that's common. For instance, conferences are common. We have our name badges. We have our coffee breaks. We have our moderator. We have our speakers. We have our agenda. And those are common things. And so there's no reason for VNU to have to invent something. They're using the standards of a conference to put on a conference. And I should be able to interchange. And I should be able to choose which blog tool. Do I use WordPress, TypePad, Blogger? It shouldn't matter. Which media gallery? Am I using Flickr, Picasa? It shouldn't matter. Which um, watching tool, which feeder, which kind of RSS reader or friend feed am I using? Which kind of IM client? And I should be able to intermix and interchange this. The customization should be inherent in everything. There are other things that should be baked into software that all software should have. We should have this authentication layer. Luckily, we have a standard called OpenID. We should have the notion of a shared graph. Again, Facebook should not control who my friends are, or hives. We should have our shared graph out there, and then all the different social networks share it. Right? We should be able to move our data between ser services, import, export. And we should be able to have actions and verbs between systems. So if I want to send a message to you on Hives and I'm on Facebook and then you send something to a German friend in Zing and then down to an Italian friend in Viadio, we should be able to do that. Right? I guess you'll have to use Esperanto to communicate though. <laughs> we need to always show who my friends are, what my content is, what my comments are. These are common notions that all software will have in the future. If you abide by these constructs and these this treaties, then you will have a system that can work in the open mesh. Now, we use the word open a lot. And it might mean open source, so you can look at my code. It might mean open data, so you can get access to the data. Right? But either way, what does it have to do with a 15-year-old me? Nothing. Right? Except I've been dreaming about this for 35 years, that's all. Now, we mentioned, uh, Marco mentioned earlier a guy named Doc Searles. Doc Searles and David Weinberger wrote a book called The World of Ends, and in it they extrapolated the notion called NEA, that nobody owns the web, that everybody can use the web, and that anybody can improve on it. And what I've got here is a shot of my young daughter with Doug, Doug Engelbart. And if you all don't know who he is, this is the guy who invented the mouse and some of the early things, and we're talking 40, 50 years ago. And there are ideas that this guy did that we're still learning about. And he didn't apply for any patents, and he gave this all away, 
And he's not some billionaire, but we're still standing on his shoulders. And that's the way all these ideas have to be. We have to give them away to be able to create the open mesh. So, now another key thing we need to do is we have to show to vendors that being open can benefit them. This is not just end users demanding. There is a real benefits to being open. And again, Unilever, uh, you know, Fortis Bank, I mean, just the companies on this block out here <laughs> are companies that could learn this lesson, right? And it's up to all of us to show them that by creating traffic and getting users' attention and being able to create compelling experiences, they will associate that with Fortis or Ben & Jerry's or Grey Poupon Mustard. Right? When we think Grey Poupon mustard, I think, oh, Grey Poupon, right? But I'm also thinking that's quality mustard. And if I could tie that quality mustard into beautiful recipes or a nice vacation or whatever, it all goes back to Unilever, and they're going to benefit from it. And so the same thing we have to do with being open, to cooperate with each other. So how is this going to unfold? Well, there's this chaotic thing unfolding, you know, We've got a bill of rights that we created. We're trying to show you that the early adopters are kind of like the pioneers and watch what they're doing. And here's another shot of my fence. Okay? And with that comes the architecture. All right, now I know this is way too geeky for you all. I apologize. But just so you know, I am a geek at heart. And there's some serious architecture here. So this is for, for y'all who want to talk about this, stay after, and we'll talk about this. Okay. All right, now I'm going to go through each of these chapters. The number one most important thing in the open mesh is the ID, is the user, is the user's profile data. Okay? In the old days, the corporations, the capitalists, every brand, they actually think that they're the most important thing. They actually call us consumers, like we're born to buy, to shop. And this is not why we are born, okay? Now, what we can be called is customers. And what we should do is swap the priority, where the most important thing is us, the user. We should be in the center of the universe. And the second most important thing are our friends and family and our relationships we have with our friends and family. And then the, the third thing on the outside circle is all of capitalism. All right, so let's get the priority straight here. All right? Now, when we say ID, that means the social graph that I have my list of friends. It means the groups that I'm a member of. It means all the different persona. So if I have me, the dad, me, my job, me, my friends, these are different persona, and I should be able to manage all these separately. So this will give you an idea of all the different aspects of just the number one main area of focus of the open mesh. The second area of focus is the idea of a persistent content, content that is in the cloud all the time, whether it is free, like the BBC or archive.org, or whether it is paid for, like iTunes or Hulu, or whether it's my own stuff. Again, it's all in the cloud. Right? The third is structured content. The idea that I can add metadata onto the content. And what I want to do is show you an example of a structured content server. Okay? So remember that we, as a collective, our consciousness is constantly growing and evolving. As every time there's a new tool or new something coming along, we're always looking for our web celebrities and what's the latest meme and the blogosphere, and everything's constantly growing and changing, right? So, oops, sorry. So imagine if we could give a feature, a service to web celebrities so they could use a public shared social graph. I don't know if you all know Boris. Boris is an example of a web celebrity. And they would have maybe 50,000 friends. And so if a new service came along, Boris or Robert Scoble or Jason Kalankanis could go and with one click invite in 50,000 people. You see the power of that? 
See, that, that puts the power into Robert Scoble's hands. It's not control, his, his social graph should not be controlled by Facebook or Google. So this idea of an hour data server is one of the crazy ideas I'm pitching, right? And the next thing we need to think about is a live web. And there's a standard called XMPP. And this is a standard we have. Imagine it's like a bus or a, a road. And all these different kinds of communication and video and text can go on this road. And we can all share that data. That's what we call the live web. And I am a toolsmith by profession. Do you all know what I did before? Oh, he told you. Yeah. Okay. So I've been doing tools for 25 years. So I'm dreaming of a new kind of tool. A tool that has community in it. See, old school tools came in a box. They were shrink wrapped. You had to read the manual. You had to pay for them in, in advance. And you worked all by yourself. New school tools are online. You can give a certain version away for free and then tier the pricing. You've got a community of people baked into the tool. So you're creating collaboratively. This is going to be a crazy new wild world. And these tools will be designed for the open mesh. And imagine if we had this dashboard and I could intermix different kind of modules and configure the environment the way I want to configure it. And this new kind of infrastructure I have that's based upon all these things I've been talking about already. And these underlying constructs. And if we can all agree to agree on similar concepts, that's the foundation of working together. So again, I'm just giving these ideas away to see if they stick, to see if anybody likes these ideas. So this is how I do it. I put it on my fence. I make it human. I make it approachable. I make it so I don't come off like some big corporate guy, right? I had my 15 minutes many years ago. I, the only thing I'm left here to do is to change the world. I'm not waking up in the morning time trying to make money. Right? I'm trying to change the world. Here's my intellectual property. But I painted it on a fence. No patents. Right? Okay. So the marketplace, as I said earlier, this is about economics. We have to make sure that everybody can make a living. So the marketplace means that we have to bake monetization into everything. So if I want to give you an extra feature, or if I want to count how many times you um, left comments so I can give you a reward, or if I want to incentivize you to bring your friends over here, and I'll pay you 100 euros if you do that. I mean, there should be lots of different ways to make money everywhere. And finally, we have to have these standards. Ways that we can all cooperate and work together. So we've been putting on various conferences. One of them is called the Data Sharing Summit. From that, we've come up with a Bill of Rights for users of social media. We've come up with some new standards called Portable Contacts. Hopefully, you'll be hearing about these things. And of course, at the end of this presentation, I need to give you a call to action. You need to leave here today thinking about how I can contribute and help build this stuff. So think of, um, let's see. Well, earlier Marco, Marco Ahitsari talked about Blick. And he talked about having a pan-European network. And I asked him the question, Marco, if I'm in England and then there's somebody in Holland, can I call each other on the same network? I mean, you know, crossing over markets, crossing over platforms, crossing over religions or cultures, this is the essence of the web. Right now, we're in a very English-centric world. And I apologize for not presenting to you in Dutch today. Okay? So the idea of that each of you and how you make your contribution, maybe it's just within the Dutch community. Maybe it's something within Europe. Maybe it's something within marketing. Each of us will make our own contributions. So. These are the various kind of ideas. The idea may be of, of a conversation that's persistent. See, because if I'm doing these Twitters and IMs and blog posts and message boards and social network things, and everything becomes a URL, and it's all in the cloud, well, that means that that conversation is there. And I should be able to go back to it a year later and pick up right where I left off. That's what we mean by a persistent conversation. 
We have to think that all software will be social. You know, there was a time. We didn't even have a menu bar. <laughs> and you go up to the menu bar, and it says new, or save, or open. Well, there used to be a time before that. Before we had email, before we had save or new. And it's the same thing with social features. From now on, all software will have a profile, will have groups, will have add as a friend, send a message, leave a comment, do ratings. This is going to be standard stuff. Okay? Oh, by the way, did I forget to mention that I have a product that can build this? <laughs> Okay, so uh, uh, available from you from your software store or near door, and the source code's available, and blah blah blah. And this is my company, and we're people from all around the world, and we're building out these systems for Mondadori, for Bell Canada, for Nvidia chips, for the U.S. Army, for the Times of India. Thank you, Bell. Wow. That's great, Mark. Thank you very much. I know that there are questions in the audience, so please take your moment and stand up so we can get a hostess to you with a uh, microphone. Get up, stand yeah. up. That's great. Mark, the first time we met was a few years ago in Las Vegas during the Microsoft uh, conference. Ah, mix. Mix, 06, and you were yelling at Bill Gates to open up, open up. Are you optimistic now about our plans? They did. It's called Live Contacts APIs. The guy, Angus Logan, who did it, is participating in our data sharing summit. He will be on stage with the panel I'm doing. And Microsoft very much is stepping up. Now, for 10 points, why did Microsoft open up? Because open is the new black? Well, yes, but more specifically, Google. Right? right? Everything that Microsoft does is in fear of Google. So if Google's opening up, Microsoft has to open up. It's peer pressure. Question. Hi, my name is David Kruiswijk. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, <clears throat> my question is, uh, I'm very happy that you touched upon the subject of money because in my analysis, money is really the culprit where you know, a lot of these ideas that we've been having for several years now about openness and compassion instead of uh, competition as a basis for all this, um, money is still the barrier that seems to hold you know, everything in, in its grip. So isn't, isn't money and the creation of a new uh, money system, which is not only centralized, but also decentralized, distributed, isn't that one of the biggest you know, uh, things we can do to not only uh, make our co collective dreams here come true, but also uh, make something that's backwards compatible to all the you know, legacy systems that are, that are out there at the moment? Right, because there's like so many ways to answer that. Like every person has to put a roof on their head and feed themselves, okay? And then every employee has to work for the good of the company to create profits for the company. And every citizen has to do something for their country or for their community of people, right? So we all have a common good, right? Now, it turns out that this economic system, by the way, we're standing here as the fiddler is fiddling over the burning city. Capitalism is crumbling in front of our eyes as we speak. Okay, maybe you walk outside and Fortis is gone. Okay? <laughs> so, now let's put this in the context of what he's talking about. When, if we can all generate enough churn to make products, to market the products, so people will buy the products, that's our future. Right? Let's just make sure that Google and Microsoft don't get all the money. That's all. Yeah, but that's still, if I may, if I may say so, that still sounds like a unidirectional proposition that you're talking about an external group of people instead of all of us. Okay, so first of all, everything I'm talking about is a not only dualistic, but like multiplistic. Like, do you know that the Russians put 70 billion into their banks? All of a sudden, Russia's connected in the international monetary system, right? So we know that whatever Google does, Microsoft will do something different. We know that whatever this standard is over here, in Dubai and Singapore, they're going to do something different. It's all about multiplistic, right? Everyone's going to figure out how to hustle in their own way to sell their services and sell their, their content or sell their technology, right? As long as there's churn going on, 
And that's the ultimate reason why the banking system is falling apart. Because everyone's so afraid to lend money, and the whole thing's based upon borrowing and selling money. Right? Now, what we have are content and services and technology that's worth something. And as long as we just churn to generate revenues, everyone will benefit. What's churn? Churn. Uh, to create a transaction, 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 transaction. Lots of uh, friction, of interaction between things. There's nothing worse than you've got your product and you sit there and there's no customer. <laughs> right? So you want to create transaction, you want to create churn, you want to create interaction between people, and that's called capitalism. Does okay, that make but sense? The, okay, but then uh, a more flowing version of it, not, not, not uh, a profit maximizing uh, thing uh, in, in principle. Anything, dude. Anything is better than nothing. Thank you. Something. <laughs> right, more questions from the audience. You please stand up so we Imagine can... Imagine uh, you're in the shuk, you know? Please, get him a microphone over there. All right, so you're in the shuk, and you want to buy this sheepskin rug, you know? And the guy says, and he says, 100 shekels. And you say, no, 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 10 shekels. And he says, 50 shekels. And you say, 30 shekels. He says, okay, I'll take 30 shekels. I mean, something's better than nothing. It's all about negotiating. It only costs him two shekels. He's still making 28 shekels. Come on. It's, it's business. It's negotiating. Question. Yes, I, I would like to know how you look upon the persona. You, well, you just mentioned that the persona is going to be a URL. How do you look upon spamming the URL or spamming the person for that matter? I read this morning in the newspaper, somebody um, tried to get a profile off of Hives. The profile was called Mark Cantor. Mark Cantor was... Um, with a lot of information about that was not you. So you try to phone Hives, you say, I don't like this profile, it's my name, it's my photo, it's information that no, has nothing to do with me. Right. But then. Okay, so a couple of answers. Um, I can talk about the present and the imperfect world of our chaotic world. Or I can talk about the ideals of where we want to go with the future. Okay? So in the ideal world, uh, through open ID, we will have a definitive way to say, I am who I am. Okay? It turns out there's another Mark Cantor. He runs a deli on West Fairfax in Hollywood. Uh, he went to school with Slash, so he was raised with Guns N' Roses. Okay? And he put out a book called Mark Cantor and Guns N' Roses. Okay? Now, I totally own Google until this guy put out a book. Now he's up on the top page selling a book about Guns N' Roses. Then I have friends call me, Mark, I didn't know you like Guns N' Roses. <laughs> okay, you know, it's okay. You know, there are two Mark Cantors, and, okay? So, now, so Open ID would help us identify exactly who we are, okay? okay? Now, we're in an imperfect world today, and you talk about all the loopholes and these assholes who spam, etc. right? I'm working on my own software that will allow us to keep track of our separate personas. So if I want to, as a father, participate in a community of other parents, and we want it to be a private community, but we're willing to share between five families information about our children that we wouldn't want anybody else to do, then I have a persona called father. That's completely different than my persona as my profession or me as a sex fiend or drug addict or whatever, <laughs> or gambler, right? So we, have, we know what we want, the problem is we're not quite there yet. Sorry. No, I don't have the I answer for all the world's problems. I understand the idea of the, the authentication of a person uh, uh, related to data <coughs> poses some kind of problem. You must uh, agree with me on that one. There's lots of problems, dude. Yeah. <laughs> lots of problems, and hopefully there will be answers, you know, and then we could all s hold hands and sing Kumbaya. <laughs> all right? Someday. <laughs> Another okay, more questions. Now, did you understand everything I said? Everything. Not, a, not one question. Come on. Not a question, nobody. Everything, every single thing I said, you totally grokked. You, everything I said, not a problem. Go. Not, no, you already asked a question. Anybody else? Come on. Question over here. We got a question. And a question up there. All right. All right. It's a race. It's a race. It's a race. It's a race. You got it. I think I won. All right, go. All right. Um, I was wondering what your vision is on how authorities work within your system, because you seem to be someone who's not too enthusiastic about authority. Or A authority. Authority, sorry, and government. The bosses. The bosses, the police. Government. Uh, when the 
How did they well, come, okay, how first did they of all, the they're getting the data anyway. I don't know too much about Holland, but in the U.S., believe me, they have all the data already. Okay? The tax man, the credit bureau, the health people, they already have the data. You know, when we talk about the clock, it's 11 o'clock, maybe 11.30. The game is almost over. And now the users are waking up going, wait a minute, I want my own data too. See, they already have our data. So we're just trying to create an equal playing field so we can have our own data, really. And imagine, remember that when someone gives something away, they're looking at your behavior pattern. You like reggae, you like chocolate, you like redheads. Okay? They then take that data and they're going to monetize it and feed back advertising and things targeted at you. So they're going to make money off of you. So what we want to do is make sure that I can get copies of my own data so I can benefit from it. If I could prove to Mercedes or Volkswagen that I like cars, that I blog about cars, I watch videos of cars, I read articles about cars, then Mercedes will offer me 200 euros to take a test drive. But if you are just somebody else, you get 2 euros or 5 euros. If Mercedes can identify me as someone who is an expert on cars, I'm worth more to them. And we should be able to monetize that. That's going to be, a, people will be able to put their children through college on that one. All right? This is what's up, up there. Question. Want another question up there? No? Question. Uh, why would you link your uh, persona to your personal identity? And who would you trust to, uh, like, uh, the privacy of your identity? Who would you trust with issuing your identity? Like okay, so we're going to have a quiz right now. We have a, a survey in the audience. Who here cares about the difference between persona and identity? Anybody? Okay. So, dude, one of the things I say in the book is I'm not going to drill down into the nitpicky details that geeks like to do to show off and to nerd out on esoteric, stupid stuff. Okay? So, now, I, I love you. I love you. I love you. I could explain to you my perception of the difference between ID and persona and answer your question, and then some other professor here would disagree with me. Mm -hmm. okay? And then the marketeer over there would say, well, we've done a research, and the persona doesn't mean anything to users, and identity frightens them, so let's call it profile. No, it's no, semantics. No. <laughs> no, but what I'm trying to say is why, uh, you know, I have, I have other identities on online, and I, I like them to be anonymous. It's just nice to be able to yell things and your boss doesn't know about it. Um, yeah. so, so why why would you want to link them in one profile and, and well, would you trust? I, 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 I didn't say that. Okay. Oh, I, I said, you, you said that you one. should be able to have multiple persona. So okay. if you don't want your boss to find <laughs> out something, hold on. <laughs> don't put it into your persona. Okay. <laughs> you know, create another persona. Okay. And if you're that stupid, you probably don't deserve your job. <laughs> okay? No, if you I... don't want your boss to find out about something, don't put your name to it. Duh! <laughs> okay? Now, that's not rocket science. Question of, oh, he's, he's got another one. All right, go hit me. There was a slide that was about privacy and access controls. I put an entire slide and a shot of New York City into my presentation yes. to anticipate you saying to me that everything in the open web is open and you have to give everything away. Yes, Mark. Did it, anybody hear that? It was a very nice picture. But, but, but did anybody hear me say that open means that you have to give everything away? Did I say that? No. I created a beautiful picture of New York City. And I said, do not trust New York City. Okay, do not, if you're going down the street in New York City and some guy comes up and says, hi, I've got this peanut shell, and don't trust him. Yeah, sure, but, but, but. Okay, so New York City means evil. And I would never assume that if I'm saying open, and I even define open as different kinds of open. Open data, open source, open this, open that. But you have to have access controls and privacy controls so each person can decide what is it they're going to show? And that answers your question about your personas. If you don't want the boss to see it, 
Don't give him access to it. Uh, this, is, this is open niche. You're not believing your own story. Okay, so let's debate this. Now, this is the geek guy, right? So I'm coming down here. All right. All right. Now, you're telling me. Now, tell me what, why open the way I defined it is not what you defined. Because it's still, it's still in, in the end of the day, it's, it's still like a walled garden proposition that you're preaching here. I think, I think the real you know, potential here is that we can find a way, with all the decentralization going on, to have an open and warm-hearted discussion also with our big bosses and the guys right. that are really wallowing in, in corrupt, yeah. you know, all right, so Money what you said was, but, but I, don't, I don't see why you interpreted what I said as a walled garden. Because, because you say, you know, this is all in, in our garden of Web2.0 oh. web, web uh, openness and, and, and wonderfulness. Yes. There's still this big outside thing called New York. There's always yeah. this big paranoia, which is a given. Right. And my, my uh, proposition would be, this is exactly the kind of thing that we can change now because we have this wonderful new infrastructure and all the APIs we can build upon it. Okay, dude, uh, uh, I, think, I, th I don't think we're disagreeing, okay? Now, if I define open, let's, let's take this in terms of galactic stuff, right? So I've got Milky Way yeah. and the galaxy yeah. and the Earth and the solar system, right? Okay, and so over there in the Milky Way, that's all open, right? <laughs> but then you still have banks. They run closed networks, right? And you still have these horrible people in New York City, yeah. and there's all these other galaxies. Yeah, this is exactly my point. We can inspire them, we can invite them to play a new and broader game. Right, right, okay. So, part of my mantra, okay, is that, okay, we're done now? Okay, yeah, all right, but here's my mantra. <laughs> okay, here's the mantra. We have to play along with these people, okay? We have to have a multiplistic world. Yeah. That's the pragmatic short-term reality, right? We have to, Visionize to the future, but be pragmatic in the short term to work with these closed worlds. But I disagree with you that by having this pragmatic compromise between the idealism of the future and working with the short term guy, that that's closed. I mean, I, I, I don't buy that. I, I agree with you that we can, Great. That we have he to agrees. play together. He agrees. But it's, Thank you we can invite much. them. We can invite them. It's going to be a party, man. Come All on. Right. Come on. All right. Avanti popolo, arariscos, samana. No, sorry. I just see. I had to do it. I'm sorry. But thank you very much. We can talk for hours. Give him a big hand with some more candle. Thank you, Mark. All right. Do you have a URL where on which we can order the book? Bill, okay, it's buildtheopenmesh.com or go to Blurb and. Look for me, B L U R B, and they right. can buy a book. Look for Mark Cantor, Without Guns N' Roses. That would be great. <laughs> Dames en heren, u kunt hier blijven zitten als u wilt luisteren naar Dave Blank over nanotechnologie. En anders zult u naar een andere zaal moeten gaan.